This video is brought to you by Raycon True Wireless Earbuds. Stick around to hear more about them and also a special offer they're making available through my channel. First up, let's talk about the review embargo restrictions. I'm only allowed to show you gameplay from the first two hours of the game and then from two very specific sections later in the game. I'm not sure why Gearbox have laid down these restrictions. They say it's to protect spoilers, but like... Reviewers know what we should and shouldn't be sharing to protect our audiences from unnecessary spoilers. And all these restrictions do is make it harder for me to show off the best parts of this game. So, I don't know, this is just a weird choice they've made. Uh, but it explains why a lot of the footage you're about to see will look a little samey. I was only allowed to show you a small slice of the game. And yeah, that's a shame because this is a pretty chunky product with plenty to show off. To be clear, Tiny Tina's Wonderlands is a standalone game. It's a Borderlands offshoot, but it's sort of unfortunately titled because it sounds like the Borderlands 2 DLC that got released a while back and that was recently made freely available on both PS Plus and through the Epic Game Store. So I'm sure that more than a few people are going to think that Tiny Tina's Wonderlands is a DLC for Borderlands 3. But it's not. It's a standalone game that is surprisingly large and, in at least a few aspects, is more ambitious than Borderlands 3 was. I mean, Borderlands 3 was really well regarded, but the tagline for that game was Borderlands 3, it's more Borderlands. While classes and build diversity were beefed up and the arsenal of weapons massively expanded and the visuals were given a nice uplift, Borderlands 3 felt very Borderlands, which was fine if that's what you were chasing, but anyone looking for any evolution of that formula was going to be disappointed. And the writing, holy shit, it is rare for a game to have writing and humor so bad that it makes you want to not log into the game but Borderlands 3 somehow reached that unenviable bar. Now, I don't want to oversell how much Tiny Tina's Wonderlands revitalizes the Borderlands formula because it's not transformative, but I found it's been more than enough to make me really enjoy this. In fact, I've enjoyed it a lot more than I enjoyed Borderlands 3, and I actually like Borderlands 3. Tiny Tina's Wonderland steps away from the arid wastes of the Borderlands and adopts an entirely new medieval fairy tale aesthetic that is brimming with color and charm. It remixes your favorite Borderlands characters into charming fairy tale equivalents, like turning one burly strong man into the fairy punch father, and it remixes fairy tale tropes into Borderlands mayhem and firepower obsessed worldview, like a quest to discover the mythical sword Extra Calibur. The combat model and class design here is much broader and more interesting than that of Borderlands 3. Classes are really wild, ranging from melee berserkers to necromancers to spell slingers, and then you can merge any two classes together to make things even more crazy. Every class is now weaving their class passives and their abilities and their equipable spells and their weapons to arrive at a combat model where shooting stuff isn't the only means of playing. Tonally, the game is that classic, often grating gearbox humor, but I think it works way better here when you're playing a tabletop Dungeons & Dragons game DM'd by Tina. The ridiculousness seems to flow and be more at home here than it was in 3, where the entire game felt it was just trying to recreate the magic of Handsome Jack, but instead it just pissed everyone off and made people turn the in-game dialogue volume down to zero. So that's all great, but Tiny Tina is still built on Gearbox's existing game engine, UI, and core gameplay design principles, and those things are getting pretty long in the tooth at this point. There are some really big issues with bugs, at least on PC. The UI is horrible, it was outdated in Borderlands 3 and it's still terrible here, with one of the worst maps and inventories I've used since Borderlands 3. From a gameplay perspective, the UI is really straining under the weight of the new features that Tiny Tina brings, and you get the sense that had this game been built from the ground up as a new product, it would have had a very different approach to things like equipable spells, controllable companions, and melee combat. But despite these shortcomings, I had a really good time with Tiny Tina's Wonderlands, and that was when I was playing it solo, when these sorts of games are way better when playing it with other people. I would liken my enjoyment of it to Far Cry Blood Dragon, actually, which was built on the bones of Far Cry 3, but because it did so much to change up the setting and remix some gameplay elements, it felt so distinct despite being an offshoot. That's Tiny Tina for me, and much like Far Cry Blood Dragon, I enjoyed it a hell of a lot more than I enjoyed the game it was built on. Okay, so let's talk about technical stuff first, since there's definitely some stuff to call out here on the PC side. I reviewed Tiny Tina's Wonderland on two PCs, an RTX 3090 with a Ryzen 5950X and an RTX 2080 Ti 
with an AMD 3700X. I ran both at 1440p ultra settings. So the good news is it runs really well on both systems. I was generally hovering at around 110 FPS on the 3090 and around 60 to 70 on the 2080 Ti. There were the occasional frame drops here and there in particular when I went into town, but overall I found it to be pretty smooth and reliable. I didn't have any crashing, so from a stability and performance perspective, I had a great experience, but as always, your mileage may greatly vary. I had a significantly worse experience when it comes to overall bugginess and the controls on PC, which are truly terrible. So bugginess first, yeah, it's, it's just really clear to me that Tiny Tina's is nearly finished, but not quite finished. There were just enough buggy UI elements in particular to tell me that Gearbox were one or two quality passes away from a polished product. I would often get UI prompts popping up where they shouldn't be, telling me that I've just been revived when I hadn't. They would tell me I couldn't equip certain items when I could. At one point, I just lost my entire quest log and I couldn't get it back. Even after I restarted the game and did a bunch of quests and did all sorts of shit, it just wouldn't come back. So I just played a bunch of the game without a quest log until suddenly it reappeared. So these bugs range from minor annoyances to actual problems. They're not gonna be total deal breakers for most people, but certainly for some, they will be. They're just generally something that everyone should be aware of, I think. Far more problematic were the controls on keyboard and mouse. Holy shit, these are terrible. Now I can't remember if they were always this bad on Gearbox games and I just didn't notice, or maybe they're actually worse here, I'm not sure. But yeah, it's extremely clear to me that this game was built for a controller and then there was some really half assed keyboard and mouse conversion that does the job just, but it's super unpleasant and at times it's straight broken. For example, you can't mouse over things on the map, you need to drag this center cursor thing on top of an icon to get it to do anything. This is a common thread with many menus and UI interfaces not recognizing mouse input consistently. So on the options menu, for example, you can click the right arrow buttons to interface with stuff. But if you want to click the left arrow buttons, that doesn't work unless you click like slightly to the right of the arrow button, because I guess they weren't properly mapped. If I sell something at the vendor by clicking on it, it will reset the game's cursor position without resetting my mouse position, resulting in situations where I accidentally sold stuff I intended to keep. Same goes for navigating this blacksmith upgrade menu where you can't even click on stuff depending on what you clicked on prior. I think the worst thing is how they handled aim speed when aim down sights on a sniper rifle. There are toggles in the menu for both look speed and aim down sight speed, but those rules are completely ignored when using a sniper rifle because aim down sights reduces the look speed to basically zero. You can't fix this without fucking up ADS for everything else, so sniper rifles are essentially unusable, or at least they were for me. I don't know if someone else found a workaround, but I couldn't get them working. There are other minor UI related frustrations, like it's not possible to pick up a new quest without the UI automatically switching to it, meaning you then need to go back into your journal to reactivate the previous quest. Cosmetics are item drops that clog up your inventory when they didn't need to be that. From a navigation perspective, the map is horrendously bad. Borderline unusable, as it's often missing bridges that connect areas, making it impossible to chart your course. And it's also just so annoying to spin it and to turn it on angles and... God, it's so bad. It, the UI in general in this game is just bad. I mean, we all said as much when we reviewed and played Borderlands 3. We were like, okay, Gearbox, this used to work. Now it doesn't work. Please get rid of this UI. And sure enough, it's all back, completely unaltered and unimproved and as frustrating as ever. That's certainly a recurring theme when it comes to Tiny Tina's Wonderland. It's a fun offshoot, awkwardly grafted onto an increasingly aged and out of date scaffolding. I can forgive most of that because this was a smaller scale project, limited horizons, etc. But when you've had the same UI for 10 years and you still haven't figured out a way to make it work properly on PC, then I'm fresh out of sympathy on that one. Given how much is reused here, there's just no excuse for it to behave this badly on PC. So that was definitely something that made me love Tiny Tina a hell of a lot less than I otherwise might have. I would say wait for patches, but I don't think it will get patched because Gearbox have had over a decade to get this right. So I don't think that a few more weeks or months is going to make the difference. The central conceit of Tiny Tina's Wonderlands is that you're playing a tabletop game of Dungeons and Dragons and Tina is the GM. That can lead to situations like this. You're not the only new arrival. I'm 
Pretty cool, right? See, Dungeons and Dragons is very much about the imagination of the dungeon master, and very few games, if any really, have properly captured the power of imagination in campaigns and scenarios that might dynamically spawn in enemies where there were none, but the transformation of an entire landscape and the events unfolding in it at the whim of the DM, that's something you don't see elsewhere, but you'll see it often here in Tiny Tina's Wonderlands, and it immediately makes the entire game feel so much more dynamic, because, well yeah, it is. Anything could happen, depending on Tina's mood or a comment made by one of the other people you're playing with. These other two people will also commentate on what transpires, or bicker amongst themselves, or offer ideas on how to overcome challenges. It's fourth wall breaking in exactly the right way it should be broken. NPCs commenting on the game within the game, creating a lot of breathing room for the silliness that Gearbox writing is based on. That's really important because the writing in Borderlands 3 was horrendous. Even people who liked that game were like, man, that writing was bad. It was just rehashing the same stuff from Borderlands 2, not understanding that making the same joke over and over again stops being funny after a while. There were no new jokes in Borderlands 3, and the villains, the Twitch streamer influencer people, they were, let's just say, not as beloved as Handsome Jack. I don't think that there are any new jokes here in Tiny Tina's Wonderlands either. I still think it's the same gearbox shtick that you're either gonna love or hate or maybe just tolerate, but I do think it works vastly better here owing to the Dungeons and Dragons premise, where spontaneity and improvisation are always gonna result in some awkward and cringy back and forth, but you can just shake it off and then move on to the next adventure. In Borderlands 3, the writing feels almost half serious at times, as though it's contributing to some sort of world building, but here it's all just make-believe nonsense and every character you meet is playing a role, in both senses of the word, and like I said, it all just clicks together much better this time around. Indeed, fair hero, everything was not fine up atop the beanstalk. The magic bean was evil! Oh no! But it's okay. New adventures await in the newly, uh... Renovated? Town of Driftwood! Really have to call out Ashley Birch for her performance as Tina. Cannot believe that this is the same person who voiced the self-serious, almost monotonal Aloy in Horizon Forbidden West just a month earlier, and now is voicing the utterly insane, completely over-the-top Tina. Unbelievable transformation, and Tina is a much preferable spirit guide over, say, Claptrap, who unfortunately does make a reappearance here in Wonderlands, and it's a bit of a low point for the game. The other person to shout out is Will Arnett, who I know best for his work as Devon Banks, but is more broadly known for his role in Arrested Development. Here, Arnett plays the bad guy, the Dragon Lord, and he really nails it. Gearbox has struggled to find a way to move out of the shadow cast by Handsome Jack, and I think the writers and Will Arnett have pulled it off, delivering an antagonist who marries villainy and comedy in just the right proportions. Ha 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 ha, that's good. Yeah, not happening. Come on, the Fate Maker never beats the villain in the first quest. Still, you're stronger than the ones she sent before. These characters and the supporting cast all breathe life into this brilliant fantasy world. It exists on two layers. The first is an overworld map strewn with thumbtacks and 20-sided dice and fallen Cheetos. The map is what you use to move between each of the game's major hub areas, both towns and playable spaces, but it's also populated with plenty of explorable side activities. Bandit camps can be entered for a quick throwdown, random temples are hidden away that house power-ups and collectibles. Cleverly, walking through tall grass will sometimes spawn random encounters, which will transition you into a small combat space for a bit of hurly-burly, some XP and some easy loot. This overworld is really nice. It's a clever trick that harkens back to the classic days of JRPGs and CRPGs, it's always nice entering it and exploring it, and it's genuinely dense enough that it represents meaningful content. There is satisfaction to be found in clearing out each newly discovered dungeon, or finding pathways to locked off areas so you can reach new NPCs and new quests. It's an example of something that couldn't exist in Borderlands, but the changing up of the setting made this possible and it's a great addition. The locations within this hub world range from impressive to fucking awesome. I wonder whether Gearbox's artists have been kind of like long-suffering because, you know, there's only so many ways you can draw a brown desert 
The landscape of Tiny Tina's Wonderlands are so crazy, so unique, and so bursting with color that you can almost feel the artist's catharsis. There's idyllic fairy tale prairies and classic medieval castles and an underwater kingdom and an entire region built in a magic beanstalk and tons of more stuff that I won't spoil. The cell shading that Gearbox have used has always made bleak settings look and feel much brighter than they otherwise might be, but applying that cell shading to settings that are already colorful I mean, this game just shines in the best possible way. I loved encountering new areas and seeing what Gearbox artists had in store for me. It should be said that the function and layout of these spaces is still as limited as it ever was. Gearbox levels are ultimately linear spaces. Combat arenas connected by corridors of sorts. That hasn't changed here in Wonderlands, and it's feeling a little dated at this point because of how little exploration it engenders, but also because of how it actively limits exploration. You might be deep into a level and see a chest or an item in the distance one or two levels below you. If you want to go and grab that, you can, but there's no way back up to where you were other than running through the level again. And because of the way that levels fold over and on top of each other, that can mean running another few minutes to get back where you were, with many enemies respawning along the way. This model of level design used to work when Borderlands was fresh and we didn't really know any better, and hardware limitations meant levels had to be smaller and kind of broken up. All of that has changed now, and these linear levels devoid of meaningful exploration are one of the many features of Tiny Tina that remind you that this game was built on another. Another major gripe within this context is that it's still not possible to mark multiple objectives on your map, which means that you might run through an entire level doing one quest and only realize at the end you could have been doing two or three other quests at the same time if the UI had let you track them. That again was something that plagued Borderlands 3 and it's not fixed here. It's such a weird choice because obviously it's a choice from Gearbox at this point. And yeah, it's ultimately just really annoying how often this UI will piss you off rather than help you out. That issue is a shame because there's actually a lot of side content to do and I enjoyed pretty much all of it. It's always about going to a place and killing some things and then maybe collecting some things and then heading back, but that's okay. That's what I play looter shooters for. And this game is always giving you enough window dressing to make those quests interesting enough, either through NPC dialogue or through visiting new locations or some gimmicky mechanic that gets introduced. You could beeline this game pretty quickly, but that would be a waste. The side content is just as good or nearly so as the main stuff. So it's definitely worth taking the time to do it. One thing I will say though, is that the entire game scales with your current level. That is the areas you visit, the quests you're completing and the enemies you're fighting. At this point, I think that this is a sort of outdated approach to looter shooter or open world design, at least in a campaign. I can understand this sort of scaling kicking in at the end game since it makes your entire game's worth of content viable at the end game, sure. But during the campaign, the net effect of this is that you feel weaker every time you level up because enemies have gotten stronger, but your gear, which is the backbone of your power, hasn't. So every new ding is you moving back one spot versus your enemies, and you're constantly playing catch up. There's enough content in this game for Gearbox to have delivered a linear, non-scaling campaign that would have moved you through it and let you feel your power growing as you did so, but they opted for this dynamic scaling across the entire game instead. It's not a huge problem, like I said I had plenty of fun, but the treadmill can start to feel a little tiresome, especially if you hit a long stretch without any decent upgrades. Overall though, I would say that when it comes to characters, writing and world design, Tiny Tina's Wonderlands is a huge shot in the arm for the Borderlands formula. After spending more than a decade on Pandora, this new mythical kingdom with its remix cast and new characters and locations just hits right. It's silly, colorful fun, and you get the feeling that Gearbox had fun making this. It's not a transformation of the Gearbox formula, but it's a really nice evolution of it towards something fresh, an evolution that is mirrored in the game's combat and loot. Tiny Tina's Wonderlands begins here in its impressive character creation tool. Where previous Borderlands games had you selecting pre-made characters, here, in the traditional Dungeons & Dragons tradition, you are creating a character from scratch. Plenty of options here, with plenty more options unlocked later during the campaign, all for free, and you can change your appearance at any time by returning back to town. Once you've created the look of your character, you're also assigning their backstory, which will affect your base stats, stuff like plus two to wisdom and minus two to strength, stuff like that. And then you select from one of the game's six classes. That's a lot of classes, right? That's more than Borderlands 3's four classes. But get this, 
when you hit a certain point in the campaign, you can actually merge classes together. So I started out as a Graveborn who focuses on vampiric dark magic and spell slinging. And I've got this floating demon thing with me all the time. But later on, I was able to unlock the Spore Warden class, which focuses on poison damage and they have a little mushroom companion. So when I did this, I actually had two companions up at all times and I was able to summon additional companions when I killed stuff or when I cast spells. And yeah, I was kind of heading up this little army of minions because this class combination let me do that. But that's just one option. There's a melee berserker, a rogue archetype, a straight mage, an armored knight, and any one of these can be combined with any other. So that's really cool to be honest. And interestingly enough, there are items in this game like rings or your armor that give perks that benefit multiple classes. So I might find a ring that gives me bonus power to the Graveminder class and the Spellshot class, which is okay for me since I only get benefit from the Graveminder stats. So I'm on the hunt for any item that buffs Graveminder and Spore Warden. When I find one of these, I'm like, hell yeah, because all of these sorts of combinations are rare, and it's nice to get something that slots so precisely into your build like that. Outside of the more ambitious class design and build craft, the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay of Tiny Tina's Wonderlands is more varied than what you got in Borderlands 3. It was very much about the guns there, but here in Wonderlands, you can run melee-focused builds since there's a melee weapon category now. Every character has an activatable ability on a pretty short cooldown, so don't think of these as ultimates. Think of them as abilities to be frequently woven into your gameplay. Finally, there's a new spell slot. Spells are items that you can loot, and they range from fireballs to frost spikes to earth sunders to summoning hydras to fight by your side. There's a huge range of them, and each spell is modified by the stats on the tome that houses it. So one fireball might have two charges while another has three, and another might have bonus crit damage while another buffs your overall spell power for 15 seconds after use, etc. So taking my class for example, I deal most of my damage through spells. I've gone deep into spell cooldown and spell damage stats to make that possible, and I have companion pets that amplify my damage, and I summon hydras whenever I kill stuff and they cast spells. I do use my gun, absolutely, but it's kind of my backup for when my spells are down. When I first saw Tiny Tina's Wonderlands, I'd assumed that it was still going to be all about the guns, and that we'd get spells on really long cooldowns, so it would still feel pretty much like Borderlands, but no, this really does feel different, or at least expanded. There are classes that do stick closer to that gun style of play. But my point with all of this is that there's just more than that now as well. There's so many distinct styles of play available to you based on which classes you pick, how you spec them out, which spells you run, and which weapons you equip. But if guns are your thing, then Gearbox has certainly got you covered there. Ironically enough, this feels like the part of the game where the least amount of ideation has taken place, which does make sense given that Borderlands 3 already delivered an expansive suite of imaginary weaponry, so putting more resources into that would have had diminishing returns. I know that a lot of the guns here are reused from Borderlands 3, I know there are some new ones as well, but I don't know, I feel like maybe 10, 15, 20% of them. I could be wrong about that. I don't recall every weapon I used in Borderlands 3, but I certainly see many familiar archetypes and designs returning here in Wonderlands. That would be a problem if this game wasn't working so hard to deliver innovation in other areas, but because of doing that, I really don't mind that I'm using the same SMG that I used for half a dozen hours back in the day. With all this innovation to classes, melee spells, and abilities, you do get the sense that One Lance could have done more with them were it not so constrained by Gearbox's existing UI and overall game design framework. Spells, for example. Yeah, they're lootable tomes, but should they be? If you'd been able to bake a spell system into the UI in a more complete way, you could have had a better combination of spells or more control about how they're cast. Same goes for companions who are all autopiloted. It would have been great to have been able to control or direct them by some means. Melee. There are no combos, it's just swing your weapon. With melee being a viable build now, it would have been nice to see a more robust approach to melee animations, combos, blocking, and parrying, etc. All of these things function just fine, but certainly if Tiny Tina's Wonderland had been designed from the ground up as a new game, completely separate from the Borderlands series, there's no way that any of these things would have ended up quite like this. There would have been better, more robust systems to support each of these additions. Beyond that, I guess I should qualify all of this by saying that even though the combat is expanded and revitalized, it's still a very Borderlands feeling game, which is to say it's still a looter shooter where you shoot brain dead enemies over and over again and collect too much loot. If you've never liked that style of play, you are still not going to like this. However, if you do like that sort of thing, then I think these additions are meaty enough that they're likely to impress you. I would love to play through this co-op because I would love to see the carnage a fully stacked party could create, each of us occupying distinct roles like 
frontline Zerker and backline Caster and hybrid spell blades weaving gunplay, spells and swordplay in a way that Borderlands, or very few games really, have ever allowed for. On that point of co-op, I should probably make the point that I wasn't able to test the co-op because I was playing solo, but I was constantly getting disconnected from the Gearbox servers, and I mean constantly. It happened so often that I was like, oh man, this is going to be a problem at launch, isn't it? I don't know that it will be, but I have a hunch that it will be. So if you're planning to pick this up as a co-op game to play through with your buddies, maybe hold off until you've confirmed from a number of sources that the co-op actually works. It's disappointing for me to have to say that, but it does fold into those complaints I raised at the beginning of the review around technical readiness. This game still needs a few more weeks in the oven to iron out the remaining issues. Not long, but a few weeks, because I saw enough to leave me pretty confident that not all of this is going to be fixed by a day one patch. And I don't even know that there's a day one patch coming, by the way, since that was never mentioned to me. That's just the bugs. Outside of that are the terrible controls on PC and the very outdated, frustrating UI that now massively holds this game back, not only from a user experience perspective, but it also holds back its core gameplay, as newly added game systems would have likely been deeper and more interesting had they had a better UI to support them. It's a testament to the overall fun factor of this game then that Tiny Tina's Wonderlands manages to survive all of this and still be a title that I had a lot of fun with and that I recommend to you. The Dungeons and Dragons setting is awesome and Tiny Tina makes for a fantastic DM. Her imagination and how it spontaneously transforms the world around you is a neat trick that never gets old. The setting also gives Gearbox's singular narrative and comedic style a home in which it fits comfortably. The world you're exploring is amazing, and such a stark contrast to the now all too familiar planet of Pandora, and the expansive new class, spell, ability, and weapon systems make Wonderlands a more ambitious game than Borderlands 3 was, at least in that aspect. For an offshoot, this title is doing a hell of a lot of heavy lifting, and if you were to ask me where Gearbox should go next, either Borderlands 4 or Tiny Tina's Wonderlands 2, I'm going to go with Tiny Tina, because I think we've all seen enough Borderlands for at least a little while. But more importantly, I just think this plays so well to Gearbox's strengths as playful, silly tricksters. So yeah, Tiny Tina's Wonderlands, I recommend it. You guys back at the gym as well this year? Man, those COVID lockdowns were not good for my abs. Or should I say ab at this point. Raycon wireless earbuds let you experience wireless audio wherever you go without having to fork out the price tag you typically pay for that experience. Raycons are literally half the price of other earbuds you've heard about, but the quality is just as good and the battery life goes the distance as well. Raycon's newest model, the Everyday Earbuds, are their best ones yet, with 32 hours of battery life, 8 hours of playtime, a built-in microphone for phone calls, seamless Bluetooth pairing, more bass, 5 different color options, and a range of custom gel tips for both comfort and to ensure a nice noise isolating fit. These things really stay in, for real. You could do the whole headbang thing and your Raycons would just stay in your ears. Just be careful when you do that though, it's bad for your neck. Raycons have over 45,000 five-star reviews and best of all, Raycons come with free shipping and a 45-day return policy, so you don't have to take my word for it. Just try them for yourself and if you aren't happy, you can get your money back. To get 15% off your order, visit buyraycon.com forward slash skill up or just click the link in the description below. Thanks Raycon for sponsoring the video and thank you for watching it.